Welcome to my channel. This is today's episode of Daily News Clips. But before I get to that, I do want to thank you for coming to my channel and for supporting me. I really do appreciate it. Today, I have something I'm excited to share with you. Um, it might not even be considered news to some, but it is to me, and so I wanted to share it with you. Um, I have talked about this site once before. There is a channel on YouTube called Expedition Bible, and uh, it is a channel that combines history, the Bible, and archaeology to show you how accurate the Bible is. I know a lot of people want to say that the Bible's not accurate at all, but this particular channel shows you that it is extremely accurate. And I'm going to show you uh, a portion of a video that is over 27 minutes long. I'm not going to show you the whole thing. But before we get started, I have to give you a little bit of background. There is a, a, a city in Iraq that was named Nineveh. It's an ancient city and it's now what's called a tell, which is a pile of the ruins of the city. And when they excavate tells, they find layers and layers and layers of civilization in them. In this particular tell, among other things, they found the palace of Ashurbanipal, who was an Assyrian president, or <laughs> king, excuse me, Assyrian king. And, uh, Ashurbanipal did something interesting when he was king. He recorded every year of his reign in what are now called eponyms. What an eponym is, is a cuneiform tablet that is columnar. And each row uh, re refers to one year of Ashurbanipal's reign. There are three columns. The first column is a name. The second column is the title of the person who's named in the first column. And that could be uh, king's scribe, historian, priest, whatever. But it has the title of the person whose name is in the first column. And then in the third column is significant events that happened in that year. For example, uh, expedition to Palestine, uh, doesn't say Palestine, but expo exposition to uh, Judea where they destroyed the Judean cities, that type of thing. And as they were going through these, they found something interesting. And this is where the story starts. And I want to show this to you because I think it's exciting to see how incredibly accurate the Bible is and how it's possible to know things about the Bible through the research of completely unrelated evidence such as Ashurbanipal's library. So all these tablets that you see here are just a small sample of the documents that came out of Ashurbanipal's library at Nineveh. As this pile of cuneiform tablets from Nineveh began to grow in the British Museum, one of the employees there was a scholar named Henry Rawlinson, who is known today as the father of Assyriology because of his role in deciphering cuneiform. So he was going through these tablets, and on multiple tablets he began to see this year-to-year -year chronology of Assyrian history. Rawlinson wrote in a newspaper article on May 31st, 1862, I am glad to be able to announce that amid the many thousand crumbling tablets from Nineveh and now in the British Museum, there were a considerable number of fragments bearing lists of names and having the appearance of official documents. These official documents that Rawlinson began to identify became known as eponym lists or Lemu lists. And this is because each year was named after a person, the government official that was over that year. 
So this is an example of what are called the eponym tablets. This is an example of a published eponym list. What appears in the column labeled eponym is a list of names. Each is the name of a single year, and each year is the name of a person who is an official over that year. The second column is the title of the person the year is named after, and in the third column are the major events that happened in that year. Emerged from these lists was a year-to-year -year chronology for a period of Assyrian history. The problem, however, was that none of these years were linked to the more modern Gregorian calendar, and therefore none of the BC dates for these Assyrian years were known. So assigning BC dates to the biblical chronology also was a problem. And biblical chronology is a big subject. I just want to take a, a bite of it in this video. I want to focus on the chronology of a single verse in the Bible, and that verse being 1 Kings 6.1. If we can understand how chronology works for 1 Kings 6.1, then we can take that understanding and apply it out to biblical chronology for the rest of the Bible. 1 Kings 6 1 says, In the 480th year after the Israelites came out of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, the second month, he began to build the temple of the Lord. So the whole Bible gives us these different measures of time across the whole biblical chronology. A great example of this is 1 Kings 6 1, which gives us a measure of time of 480 years between these two significant events of the Exodus and the building of the temple in Jerusalem. We know what year the temple began to be built in Jerusalem. It was the fourth year of Solomon. We know what month. The problem is, is we don't know what BC date is the fourth year of King Solomon's reign. The way that they measured time in ancient times is different than the way that we measure it today. So how do we get a BC date for the fourth year of King Solomon's reign? Because if we have one, then all we have to do is add 480 years, and then we'll have a BC date for the Exodus. So the one who came up with a chronology that had a solution to this dilemma was the archbishop and scholar that lived back in the 17th century AD named James Usher. And in 1650, he published a book on his chronology of the world. So what he did is he went way back in later history when dates were known and correlated with the ancient calendar. And then from those known dates, he counted backwards through time into the Old Testament period. And in this way, he was able to estimate BC dates for the Old Testament. And so he came up with the year 1012 BC as being the fourth year of Solomon's reign. And then since uh, Solomon began to build the temple in the 480th year, meaning 479 full years had passed, he added 479 to 1012 BC and came up with the date of the Exodus, 1491 BC. This then became the generally accepted date for the Exodus, 1491 BC, and that was the case for the next over 200 years. With this big pile and all these inscriptions and all these tablets, uh, Rawlinson was overwhelmed, and so he hired a young man named George Smith because George Smith had mastered cuneiform. And so Rawlinson had identified seven of these eponym canons. None of them were complete. And so one of the tasks that George Smith had was to go and do a translation of each one of these eponym lists and then draw the information from all of those incomplete lists to make a master eponym list that listed out year to year a chronology for the Assyrian history. Smith would eventually publish his work in 1875 in his book entitled The Assyrian Eponym Canon. Starting on page 57 is the list of Assyrian eponyms, with the dates and events drawn up from the seven copies of the canon and other sources. I want to use this list to illustrate how Smith developed it over time. So he was in the process of doing this in 1867. He was translating the eponym canon number five out of these seven, and he was going through and making his translation of it. This is the Assyrian eponym Canon 5, today labeled as K51 in the British Museum collection. 
The name Smith translated as Asdu Sarab, which was later changed to Bursa Gale, was the name of the year named after the governor of Gozan. And in the next column, the events that took place in that year, including that the sun was eclipsed. So it was 1853 that Rossum found that tablet in this hole. And then it wasn't until 1867 that George Smith is sitting reading it, translating it in the British Museum. And he read about the solar eclipse. He just needed to know two things. Where was that solar eclipse observed from? Nineveh, Assyria. And when, just generally when, around the 8th century BC. Then he could go look at the solar eclipses that had happened in and around the 8th century BC and easily find the one that would have engulfed Nineveh in darkness. And so he found something very rare in archaeology. He found a date that was known with certainty, and that date was June 15th, 763 BC. So what is a solar eclipse, and how does it give us a specific date? Hey everybody, this is Barry here. As you may be able to tell, I am not in the Middle East this time, but I am here in the middle of nowhere, Texas, watching the April 2024 eclipse. As you can see, or well, not see, I guess, it's gotten a lot darker and we've almost reached the point of totality when the moon is completely covering the sun. So I don't even know, you probably can't even see me right now because of how dark it is. That would be so freaky if I was just a ancient Assyrian dude sitting around not expecting that and then all of a sudden it goes pitch black on you. You can't see anything. I can, I can understand why that would be taken as a, a bad omen. <laughs> that makes sense. That was crazy. I will see you guys back in Iraq. So why does it matter that George Smith found a, a tablet talking about a solar eclipse? Well, I was just in Texas and saw the solar eclipse. And the thing is, everybody knew when it was going to be. Everybody knew that it was going to be April 8th. They knew down to roughly the minute that it was going to be, depending on where you were at. So why can we predict eclipses so accurately? Well, first, let's talk about what an eclipse actually is. An eclipse occurs when the moon comes between the Earth and the sun and basically casts a shadow on the Earth. Now, you can see from the moon orbiting the Earth that this actually happens quite frequently, about once a month. So why don't we get an eclipse every month? Well, from a two-dimensional view, it looks like we should, but we get the answer when we look at the third dimension. You see, the moon's orbit around the Earth is actually at a tilt. That means that the moon not only has to be between the sun and the Earth, but it also has to be at the right place in its orbit height-wise. Otherwise, it's too high or too low to cast a shadow on the Earth. Now, there are a couple more factors if you really want to get into the details, but that's roughly how eclipses work. And because we know pretty much exactly how the moon orbits the Earth and how the Earth orbits the sun, we can predict pretty much down to the second when eclipses will be. Not only can we predict when it'll be, but we can also predict where it'll be on the surface of the Earth. And just like we can look forward and predict when eclipses are going to be, we can look backwards and tell when they were. In fact, NASA has a page on their website dedicated to future and past eclipses. And if you go to negative 762, then you'll see the one that went over Nineveh. The reason it's negative 762 instead of 763 BC is because they're using astronomical years and we use Gregorian years, but it's the same eclipse. So because George Smith knew when roughly the eclipse happened around the 8th century BC, and he knew where it was seen from, Nineveh, he could look back and using astronomical data, pinpoint the exact eclipse um, that was recorded in that tablet. And that was the eclipse on June 15th, 763 BC. And that is incredibly significant because that gave an absolute date to at least part of Assyrian chronology and ultimately biblical chronology. So because my son and I were working on this project, we had the NASA catalog of solar eclipses. And this lists out the solar eclipses that are still to come uh, in the future, all the way out to about the year 3000 AD, and the ones that have already happened all the way back in time to about 2000 BC. So I have this catalog, and I remember 
that I saw a solar eclipse when I was a kid. And so to identify this in the catalog, I needed to know where I saw it from. And I, I knew that it was from Saudi Arabia. That's where I grew up. My dad worked for the oil company there. And then the general time period, I knew that I had seen it at some point in the 1970s, though I didn't know the exact year, much less the month or the day. And so it was a simple process of going back in this catalog to the 1970s, start looking at the solar eclipses that happened in that decade, and then identifying the solar eclipse that was observable from Saudi Arabia. And I found it easily. I saw that solar eclipse on April 29th, 1976. And so it was an amazing thing for me to find personally in my own life an exact date that I could attach memories to. And this is exactly, I realized, how George Smith did it. Now Smith knew the eponym year mentioning the eclipse of the sun was 763 BC. Because there was a complete list of years, this one known year meant that all the other years could be worked out up and down the chronology. In other words, the one date led to working out all the other dates. In this way, over a span of some 244 years of Assyrian history, every year became known from about 892 through 648 BC. The result was that now the BC dates for the Assyrian chronology were now known. And so the question then was that now that the Assyrian chronology had been worked out with BC dates, was there any way to sync the Assyrian chronology together with the biblical chronology? And in order to do this, you need a shared event between those two histories. Now that Smith knew that the year that the Assyrian king Sennacherib had ascended the throne at Nineveh was 705 BC, he therefore also knew that four years later when the record says Sennacherib led an expedition to Palestine that this was 701 BC. Now keep in mind that in the 1800s when Smith was compiling and publishing his material, ancient Judah was known as Palestine. So he translated Sennacherib's expedition to Judah as an expedition to Palestine, so that the readers would know where the text was referring to. 2 Kings 18.13 says, In the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib king of Assyria attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. So BAM! That was it! The fourteenth year of King Hezekiah's reign in the Bible is the same year as Sennacherib's fourth year in the Assyrian chronology. So this is the Taylor prism, and this gives Sennacherib's own account of his invasion of the kingdom of Judah. 701 BC transferred over to the biblical chronology, and in the same way it had worked with the Assyrian chronology by knowing the one date, now the other dates for the biblical chronology could be worked out from that one date. Now I should mention that there is more than one shared event between the Assyrian and biblical chronologies. Uh, but I am only using one as an example so you can understand how it works. I hope to cover the others in future videos. So all you have to do is take the 14th year of King Hezekiah, his reign 701 BC, and then the Bible gives us how many kings ruled over Judah, how many years they reigned, and so you just count uh, that number of years back to the fourth year of Solomon when he began to build the temple which was 966 BC. And then all you have to do is add 480 to the 966, and then you have the biblical date of the Exodus in 1446 BC. So up to this point, the generally accepted date for the Exodus was 1491 BC. That was overturned because of this discovery, and the generally accepted date for the Exodus became 1446 BC. Now isn't that fascinating? I, <clears throat> I just love stuff like this. <laughs> I'm a geek for it, okay? It's, it's just exciting to learn all this stuff in my mind. Uh, I know a lot of other people might be like completely bored by it, but it just fascinates me. It absolutely fascinates me. Now, I have a couple of other... Uh, 
items that I want to share with you today. This first one is titled, Dr. Fauci asked to turn over private emails, phone records to House Subcommittee investigating COVID-19 pandemic. I've highlighted a little bit of this and I'm going to read it to you. The chair of the House Subcommittee investigating the COVID-19 pandemic is asking for Anthony Fauci's private emails and telephone records relating to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, EcoHealth, and the origins of the coronavirus. The letter sent by Representative Brad Winstrup of Ohio on Wednesday is a part of an escalating probe into the virus's origins that lawmakers say has uncovered efforts to hide official government correspondence, evade Freedom of Information Act requests, and avoid public transparency. Fauci is slated to appear in front of the subcommittee Monday, his first congressional appearance since retiring from government service as the longtime head of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. So this is a big deal. We're starting to get to the root of the issue with the COVID-19, the origins of the COVID-19 virus. And if it can be proven that the United States was involved, which it certainly looks like they were, in funding that research, then it could have a ripple effect across the world. It could generate tons of lawsuits, just absolute tons of lawsuits. So it'll be interesting to observe that as it goes forward. Now, the third item that I have today, and I only have three, is an interesting discovery in Pennsylvania. Uh, in the wastewater of a fracking site, they found lithium. And when they investigated, they discovered that there's enough lithium deposits in this one location to supply up to 40% of U.S. demand. That is astounding. Prior to this, we've been completely dependent upon China, China for all our lithium. This will remove that dependence to a great degree. And as I'm sure you're aware, lithium is now used in batteries. And of course, they're pushing electric cars on us. And those use lithium, ba lithium batteries. So uh, a, a source for lithium could possibly significantly, significantly reduce the cost of batteries. I know that I have read uh, in the past things like replacing the batteries in a Tesla costs about $60,000. And obviously, like anything else in a car, batteries wear out. When they wear out, they have to be replaced. So uh, if that cost could be brought down to 40000 even, that would be a significant reduction in cost of, of replacement. May even make electric cars more affordable. Not that I would ever buy one, because uh, I just the, the the infrastructure isn't there to to travel any kind of distance at all. I mean, I could not drive from my house to Wichita, Kansas, where I have good friends, longtime friends, without recharging once on the trip. That's just crazy. I mean, I can drive all the way to Wichita on a tank of gas, but I can't drive all the way to Wichita on an electric car. Unless I buy one of those $100,000 models. But anyway, that's the news for today. Oh, don't forget. I showed you this yesterday, but I wear my shirts for two days, so I'll show it again. <laughs> as I promised. And as I do with every video, I will pray for you. I pray that you have an abundant life, that you live a long time, that you're healthy and that God keeps you safe from harm, and that you're born again if you're not already. I pray the same thing for every person that you love. More than anything, I pray that you will be anxious for nothing, but in all things, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, you will make your requests known to God, and the peace that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. 
This is the Vietnam era vet out.